Welcome to Double Deal, a series about organized crime in 20th century Boston. The stories of our central character, Richard Tchaikovsky. The criminals, the crimes, and the law enforcement officers who rule the streets. Nina and I will be your guides through the darkest streets of Boston, telling you the true stories of criminals, crimes, and lies. Hi, everyone. When we left you last week, the postal authorities had decided to recruit Billy Aggie to assist in bringing the perpetrators of the Plymouth mail truck heist to justice. If you listen to episode two, you're familiar with Billy's past antics. But for those of you who haven't heard that one, we're going to give you a brief history of what Billy was up to prior to August of 1962. Who in their right mind would think that recruiting Billy would be a good idea? The authorities were obviously desperate not to have a repeat of the Brinks investigation. I still have my doubts about whether or not the actual planners and participants were convicted in that crime. I suspect we aren't the only ones, but we'll never know. Let's talk about Billy's background. His full name was George William Agisatelis. There's conflicting information about his birth date and his last name. I can't tell you how many different spellings I've come across, but according to his MCI Walpole records and draft card, he was born on January 31st, 1921. Billy was described as 5 feet 8 inches, weighing about 148 pounds, and with a dark complexion. To describe him as a degenerate gambler would have been an understatement. In Richie's words, Billy would have bet on a fucking chipmunk if you strapped a saddle on it. Billy had some minor scrapes with the law in his, in his younger days. He got married in 1942 and enlisted in the Army shortly afterwards. He served as an aircraft gunner in a B-17 heavy bomber unit and flew 26 missions in the European theater. He was awarded two distinguished flying crosses and his unit was awarded two presidential unit citations. In 1944, he was discharged on an 80% disability due to combat fatigue. When Billy returned to Watertown, he was in need of a vehicle and found himself in Jack Kelly's used car lot. I have my doubts about how true that story is. They both lived in the same neighborhood since childhood, and there was only a roughly five-year age difference between them. Either way, their criminal relationship began after that fateful meeting in the car lot. Jack was already an experienced thief by then, and we assume that he showed Billy the ropes. For those of our listeners who haven't listened to our first episode, let's give them a brief history of some of the scores Jack and Billy did together up to the Harvard Trust robbery in 1954 and finish off with Billy's 1956 robbery in Wallison. In October of 1947, they robbed a locked armored truck that was delivering the payroll of the Thompson Wire Works for $20,000. They unlocked the truck, took the loot, relocked the truck, and disappeared, unbeknownst to the two guards who were delivering another payroll. In April of 1949, three men waited outside the Copley Square Hotel until they saw the payroll delivered and the armored truck drive away. Once the coast was clear, they entered the hotel and went directly to the second floor offices where the payroll had been dropped off just moments before. The door to the accounting department was locked, but one of the men knocked and an employee answered. The men took the still unopened bags of cash and escaped out the rear entrance of the hotel, disappearing into the crowd. In August of 1949, an unlocked armored car in Brookline was hijacked and robbed as the guards were collecting the tithes from a church. The police initially thought that only $15,000 had been taken, but upon further investigation, it was revealed that $40,000 was missing from the truck. Then on October 30th, 1950, two men robbed the Newtonville branch of the Newton National Bank. They were armed with submachine guns and disguised with Halloween masks. The press noted that they were striking similarities to this robbery and the Brinks job in timing and technique. The getaway driver this time was a man in drag wearing lipstick, rouge, and a kerchief on his head. They took over $50,000 from that heist. In July of 1951, they robbed the National Bank in Somerville of $33,000. The holdup occurred just as the bank was opening on a Friday morning. Same M.O. with the masks and submachine guns. They were dressed as policemen this time. Their next score was the Newton Waltham Bank. It was robbed of $30,000 in September of 51. And now for the final heist that Jack and Billy pulled together. On April 1st, 1954, the Harvard Trust Company in Belmont was robbed mid-morning. Nearly $15,000 was taken. Then on May 25th, Billy and Jack went to the Suffolk Downs racetrack. The cops had been waiting there for 10 days. At the $50 bet window, Billy pulled a wad of 16 $1 bills out of his pocket and slipped it to Jack, saying, say you won this gambling. 
The cops arrested both of them and found the money on Jack. The FBI alleged that the money was from the Harvard Trust robbery and the authorities held Jack on charges of receiving stolen goods. Billy was released since he had slipped the cash to Jack and no longer had it on him. But the jury couldn't agree on whether or not Jack was guilty of receiving stolen goods, so a mistrial was declared in January of 1955. But they did acquit him of a secondary charge of possessing a 45 without a permit. That charge stemmed from a late search of Jack's house. The retrial began in March the same year, and the judge declared that Jack could not be convicted of both robbing the bank and receiving stolen goods, so the jury had to choose one crime or the other. Jack was subsequently found guilty of the lesser charge of receiving stolen goods and sentenced to four to five years in state prison. He was also allowed to remain out on bail pending a second appeal, which he lost. Jack served a total of 22 months, half in Concord and half in the Plymouth Forestry Camp. Billy wasn't just running with Jack, though. Occasionally, he would attempt less fruitful endeavors on his own or with other lightweights. He and an employee of the Union Club robbed a payroll that was being delivered in January of 1950. The employee got $1,200 and Billy $700. His weapon of choice for that heist was a lead pipe wrapped in a rag. After Jack and Billy's partnership ended, Billy and two other men robbed the Wollaston branch of the Granite Trust Company on May 11, 1956. But things didn't go quite as planned. Billy decided that he had the perfect alibi, his mother's funeral. He borrowed his brother's car and picked up his accomplices and headed to Quincy. At 9.20 a.m., Billy and his two accomplices sped away from the bank after robbing it of 4,600. They were driving a green Buick, which they abandoned one and a half miles from the bank on the corner of Safford and West Guantam Street. The cops were in pursuit. This is where the trouble really started. The two other men jumped into another car, but Billy took off on foot through the fairway of the Wallston Golf Course. At that point, the police had cordoned off the area in a 10 square mile radius. Hundreds of police, Coast Guard helicopters, minesweepers, and even an amphibian plane were all hunting down Billy. So what did Billy do? He commandeered a lawnmower from the greenskeeper at the golf course. A lawnmower was his getaway car. The greenskeeper tried to stop Billy, but Billy told him someone had gotten hurt and he wanted to help him, and off he went. Billy was cruising at a respectable 25 miles per hour when he reached the edge of the golf course and turned onto the street just in time to sideswipe a priest driving two caddies home from the golf club. As Billy once again tried to flee on foot, he was shot in the stomach by a police officer. The cops asked the priest to give Billy the last rites. After his escapade on the lawnmower, Billy earned a reputation as a desperado. To top everything else off, Billy had the keys to the abandoned getaway car and the bullets in his pockets. The other two suspects, one of them being Tommy Richards, were bought in for questioning but later released. Once Billy recovered from his wounds, he was tried in Dedham Superior Court and found guilty on September 27, 1956. The jury returned the verdict in one hour and 15 minutes. He was sentenced to 13 to 14 years in state prison for the bank robbery and an additional three to five years for stealing the lawnmower. The sentences were to run concurrently. Initially in Walpole State Prison, Billy was so unpopular that he was voted out by the prison guards. In January of 1958, Billy was transferred to the Concord State Prison, where he was almost immediately placed in the hole for 15 days for causing a disturbance by bouncing his mattress off his cell door. And that's where he met Richie and Roy. Let's move on to the master plan that the Postals came up with. William F. White had been named inspector in charge just 11 months previously. He was a native of Boston who joined the post office as a letter carrier in 1929. Ten years later, he graduated from Bentley School of Accounting. Three years after that, White was appointed an inspector in the Philadelphia Division of the Postal Inspection Service. He transferred back to Boston in 1944, where he had been ever since. In 1952, White started assisting in investigations outside of the New England area, and in 1958, he was assigned to investigate major fraud cases. Newly appointed Boston Police Commissioner Edmund McNamara announced that he was putting all of his resources at the disposal of the Postals and the FBI. McNamara said he personally felt that the mail robberies was more susceptible to being solved quickly than the Brinks job had been. And McNamara would know since he had been the FBI's lead investigator on that case since the first night, and it helped to bring it to a dramatic conclusion. At the same time, McNamara had also been the liaison officer between the FBI and the Boston Police Department. J. Edgar Hoover described McNamara as alert, diligent, aggressive, and skilled. 
Jack was very familiar with Edmund McNamara and how he operated. After all, McNamara had been the one who questioned him just hours after the Harvard Trust job and who arrested him at Suffolk Downs in 1954. Jack was zigzagging across New England in an effort to confuse his tales with Richie at the wheel. The others were working. Jack wanted to see the pattern the investigators were making, but it seemed like they were interested in bums and idiots while stating that the case would be solved shortly. In the meantime, Macris was poking around trying to find out what, if any, progress the investigators had made. Every two or three days, the boys would turn to take turns rolling the pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters from the heist. Then they would go around to bars, restaurants, and shops, trading in a few rolls here and there for bills. The same for the singles. The boys would hit the spots where large bills were tendered, switch out the wads of ones and fives for fifties and one hundreds. Jack threw caution to the wind and decided on a little mischief instead. To make himself stick out like a sore thumb, he chose to buy a black Cadillac Coupe de Ville. No matter how incompetent the surveillance team was that would be following him, it would be impossible for them to botch tailing him. That was the way he wanted it, a new game of cat and mouse. Being the cheapskate that he was, but also extremely wise, Jack wasn't going to spend any of the loot on his new ride. He had his electronics man in the Comav shop remove his faux-fed transmitter receiver first. Then the old ride went to Eddie's chop shop. The next day, he reported it stolen. Once the insurance claim was processed, check in hand, Jack purchased his shiny new caddy. His bases were covered. Dad was happy to be behind the wheel of the caddy. It was a much more welcome change to the broken down old car with rotting floorboards, bald tires, and wiper blades. Richie clearly understood that Jack was being obvious for a reason. The law was watching Jack, and Jack was watching them, but who was who wasn't so clear. In the first eight months that Jack had the caddy, he and Richie put 50,000 miles on it. They moved around so quickly that the surveillance teams had difficulty tracking them. The authorities procured a lightweight plane to monitor Jack's neighborhood beginning at daybreak. The plane would then alert the men on the ground where he was headed. This went on for months. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's get back to Billy. Dad's handler, Special Agent H. Paul Rico, had the idea to track down Billy. Rico had been in the FBI for over a decade at this point. While Rico had been not been assigned to McNamara's Brinks team, he did play a peripheral role, including the arrest of Fats Buccelli and Wimpy Bennett in 1956. You can listen to episode seven for that story. Rico had also partnered with other agents over the years, including John F. Kehoe, who you might also remember from our episode about the Brinks job. Kehoe will be making more appearances as we move further into the season. But now Rico had a new partner, Gerard Spencer Komen, the rookie. A Maryland native, born in 1940, Gerard had played football in high school. Komen had joined the FBI straight out of college just a few months earlier, and Rico got stuck with him, teaching him the ropes. Rico knew that Billy would have tried to find out who pulled off the heist the moment he heard about it. With Special Agent Komen in tow, they headed to Watertown to see if they could find Billy in one of his usual haunts. Billy was still on parole for the Wollaston heist, so it would be easy to pressure him. It wasn't too hard to find Billy. He was a creature of habit. They stopped at the used car lot that Billy was known to operate. Rico berated Billy, telling him he wanted the names of the Plymouth guys, but Billy kept insisting that he had no clue. Rico wouldn't let Billy wriggle out of it that easily, saying that Billy must know because he was such a busybody. Then he threatened to violate Billy's parole and put him back in prison. Under the pressure being exerted by Rico, Billy could only think of three men. One had a bad ticker, one was in the can, and the other was Jack. Billy's only doubt about Jack was that he had seen Jack and the others hanging in the scene only an hour after the heist was reported. In Billy's twisted logic, Jack must be clean, so that's who he would feed them. At least that's what Billy would later claim. So Billy gave up Jack. This was no surprise to Rico, as Jack was already on the FBI's list of suspects. And Rico probably suspected that Billy had set Jack up for the pinch at the racetrack back in 54. After all, Billy did pass Jack the bills just before McNamara arrested him. Rico then demanded to know who else Jack had in his crew. Billy swore up, down, and sideways that he had no clue. Rico knew that going after Jack wouldn't be easy. He wouldn't crack. Their best bet was to use Billy to suck Jack in, good old-fashioned entrapment. Their usual M.O. But since the Postals were in charge of the investigation, they would have to be the ones to soil themselves with Billy's bullshit. Rico could wash his hands of the whole thing, but he wouldn't let Billy just slither away, either. 
All pertinent law enforcement agencies were informed that the Postals had an informant and that their target was John J. Red Kelly. Then the Postals approached Billy with a deal, telling him that they would pay him $75 a week to report on Jack and the others. A reward of $100,000 was also held out as a carrot if Billy could manage to implicate Tommy Richards in the Wollaston robbery. Billy did at least have the presence of mind to ask how they were going to get that kind of money. The Postals told him that they planned to take up a collection of $100 from the the 1,000 postal inspectors in the country. Anyone who wouldn't kick in would be transferred to Boston. Nobody wanted to be in Boston, and so all of them would pay. Billy bought it. They also promised him immunity, passports, the end of his parole, and the reward money deposited in a Mexican bank account. The Postals weren't above using the stick, though, either. They, too, threatened to send Billy back to prison if he didn't cooperate with them. According to Billy's later story, he didn't agree right away. He claimed that several days passed before he contacted the Boston office at the urging of his wife. And Jax wasn't the only name that Billy gave them. He also told them to look into Joseph C. Tripoli of Lawrence. Billy claimed to have met Tripoli through Jack as Tripoli was also in the used car business back in the 50s and Billy was buying vehicles from him for his taxi business. It should be noted that Joe Tripoli had no prior record. At the time surveillance began on him, he owned a tavern in Lawrence. In addition to them offering Billy money, Tripoli claimed that he was offered immunity and $250,000 for information and testimony regarding the mail robbery. His home and businesses were searched and items illegally removed. Tripoli would go on to say that there was bad blood between himself and Billy. Who didn't have a gripe with Billy? Well, he wasn't going to win any popularity contests. In the meantime, the Postals bought the house next door to Billy and placed an agent named Earl Wheeler in it. They also set up a direct phone line from Billy's basement to the basement of the house next door. But instead of calling, Billy would just walk over every night to the back door. Wheeler's dog would bark, signaling Billy's arrival, and the two men would sit and chat while Billy reported his progress. In return for his $75 a week, Billy was wired up with a microphone that was placed just below the second button of his shirt with a wire that ran to the small recorder that hung in his armpit from a strap over his shoulder. Billy's only mission was to meet up with Jack and get him on tape. One issue was the recorder sounded like someone with pneumonia wheezing and whining. Not very covert. Billy's biggest fear was what would happen to him if Jack found out. Prison was one thing, but crossing Jack would be a final event. And just when it all seemed hopeless, a present was dropped on Billy's lap. Maurice Pro Lerner. Our next episode will be dedicated to Pro, but we'll give you a little background here. Most believe he was called pro because he was a former baseball player, but it was actually short for professor. He was an excellent student and extremely bright, especially when it came to mathematics. The nickname stuck when he became a minor league ball player. Billy happened upon pro in the scene. The Brookline native was back in town after wrapping up the current baseball season. Pro was looking for action, and Billy was looking for protection from a fresh new face. Pro's good looks and strong physique drew Billy in, and now Billy had an excuse and possibly a bodyguard to approach Jack with. My suspicion is that Jack may have actually sent Pro to Billy as a way to lure Billy in closer. Pro had been dropped from the roster in Charlotte in late May of 1961. He returned home to Brookline for the summer and was trying his hand out at crime. Not very successfully, but I have my theories about that. I'll elaborate on them in our next episode, but maybe Jack and Pro crossed paths back then. Anything's possible. You know, I think Pro allowed himself to get caught in order to put himself on the radar radar and build some kind of street cred for himself. But for certain, in late September of 1962, he was making his entree into criminal society. On a rainy evening in the final week of September, Jack and Richie were going to dinner at Anthony's Pier 4. Its location was perfect for Jack. The narrow bridge that led from downtown Boston to the pier was the only way in or out by road. That single passway allowed Jack to see who was following him and give those following him an easy time of it. That night, both Jen Kunis of the Postal Authority and Komen of the FBI were assigned to surveilling Jack and, Jack and Billy's attempt to contact him. There were 25 agents from the Postals, the Stadies, the BPD, and the Feds tailing Jack and Richie. The authorities decided to wait on the other side of the bridge rather than get caught up in the traffic. Billy passed Rico, and Rico wondered who was in the car with him. Jack and Dad took a table that would normally fit six people. This was typical for Dad, whether for an unexpected guest or the abundance of food he would order for himself. The staff never questioned it because what he would spend and tip would surely be more than any other patron. Richie ordered main courses as appetizers. 
everything in the ocean, basically, plus a salad covered in Roquefort dressing to wash it all down. Jack ordered a salad of lettuce and tomatoes and some canned orange slices. He was convinced that all that seafood was dangerous for you as they ate all sorts of waste, but the diner grub was healthy in his mind. Before Dad could dig in, Jack reminded him, that stuff will fucking kill you. Dad replied, it's better than living off of fucking nothing running around with you all day. Before Jack could get out a response, he spotted Billy Aggie speaking to the maitre d'. But the man who was with Billy was of more interest to him. Jack wanted to know who the kid was. He'd already labeled him as capable, a natural-born killer. Jack made eye contact with Billy and motioned for him to come to the table. As Billy and Pro approached the table, Jack asked Billy who his friend was. Billy made the introduction, and Pro decided to sit next to Richie. But Richie was frozen. The bulge in Billy's coat pocket caught Richie's eye, and the only thing on his mind was that Billy was packing and was going to take them out. Sitting ducks. Unarmed, Richie was thinking about slipping under the table, but then it dawned on him that the stranger who had just sat down beside him might be there to take them both out. Still standing, Billy drew the pistol from his pocket and blurted out, I want to borrow $50,000 from you, you know, from the money from the Plymouth heist. Billy was trembling, but Jack was laughing. He slipped the pistol from Billy's hand and deposited it in his own pocket before anyone was the wiser. Billy, if I knew where there was 50 grand, I'd take this gun of yours and go steal it myself. Pro started laughing and Dad went back to buttering his roll. Billy was now the only one frozen. Jack convinced him to sit down and join them. Jack ordered everyone around, but before Billy could gulp down the first drink, he had already ordered a second. He sat there in silence while Jack, Dad, and Pro got acquainted. Pro told stories about his baseball days, his time in the Marines, and the carpets he claimed he was currently selling. Jack knew Pro's dad was a small-time bookie. In the meantime, Billy's tape recorder was rolling. Hey, Billy, you ought to see a doctor. You don't sound so good. You're wheezing. Must be those cheap cigars you smoke. Billy agreed that he should get an x-ray. He could hardly contain himself. Prison was a better option than this. Not one to miss a chance to break Richie's balls, Jack went on a tirade about how everyone should throw away the cigars or they'd end up like Billy. At that, Jack rose to his feet and brought the evening to an end. He wished Billy good health and asked Pro for his number, which he was happy to provide in the form of a business card. Jack headed for the caddy with Richie in tow. The first thing out of Richie's mouth was about Pro. What's this guy Maury's story? Jack responded, he's got real capabilities. Oh, and watch your driving. There are at least 18 cars filled with Phoebe's postals and cops waiting for us over the bridge. Back at home, Billy continued to call Rico and Wheeler. He was terrified and ready to have a nervous breakdown. The authorities could care less if Billy lived or died, but Billy was certain that he wouldn't make it out of this in one piece. In addition to Jack and Joe Tripoli, Billy gave the authorities the name of Tommy Richards. To add to Tommy's headaches, his brother-in-law, who worked for the IRS, also gave Tommy's name to the Postals. He claimed that he believed that Tommy was living above his means. This led to Tommy's home being destroyed by the Postal Inspectors and Federal Marshals in October of 1962. Tommy's neighbors were questioned. Many said that they saw strange men coming and going and were asked to provide descriptions of them. His bank accounts were reviewed and a wiretap was requested from the feds. They also discovered that Tommy had begun construction of a new patio in August, which was completed in late September. On October 2nd, when Tommy was returning home from work at about 8.15 in the evening, he spotted two government-issued Chevrolets on his street. Instead of heading home, he stopped at the packy for a beer and to use the payphone to call Roy to let him know what was happening. By the time Tommy made it through the door, three postal inspectors were in his living room. They told Tommy to sit down, and he snapped back at them for telling him to sit down in his own home. They immediately started questioning him about the money stolen from the mail truck. Tommy denied any knowledge and asked them to leave. On October 16th, Barrett and Scanna, the two postals, were brought to the Fall River Post Office to view Tommy from afar to see if they could ID him. Scanna and Barrett said that Tommy was wearing the same type of eyeglasses that the robber who was wearing the police uniform had on. Tommy was called in for questioning. As we mentioned, on the evening of October 2nd, Tommy called Roy to let him know about the heat on him. The following day, Jack and Tommy met in Quincy, then on the 7th in Watertown. This would be their last contact for months. But the immediate concern for Jack was moving the cash, a dangerous task knowing full well that Tommy's home would be under 24-hour surveillance. Jack knew from his own surveillance that the coverage of the home would be light on the day that the authorities would ask for the warrant. 
On October 22nd, Richie dropped Jack off at Filene's in downtown Crossing. The traffic and people were so dense in that area that Jack was able to disappear into the crowd, losing any tails. But before Jack departed, he directed Richie to park the car in an obvious place. He told Richie to be at the diner in Watertown the next morning at 8.30. A car would pull up, toot the horn twice, and Richie was to get in the passenger seat. Jack had to get a message to Tommy. Although Jack believed loyalty was necessary, survival was crucial. The message was, you do what you have to do, and I'll do what I have to do. Dad parked the caddy directly across from police headquarters on Berkeley Street and decided to indulge in a peaceful dinner before catching a cab home. Their tails did notice Jack exit the car, but lost him almost instantly. They also noticed that Dad parked next to police headquarters, but why they couldn't quite figure out. The following morning, October 23rd, at 8.23, the agents assigned to observe the house saw Tommy's wife's black 1961 Chevy station wagon emerge from behind their house and onto the driveway and down the street. The other agents followed Tommy to work, but the other their agents were told to maintain surveillance on the house and not follow Tommy's wife. At 8.35 at 8.35, a 1961 black Chevy station wagon that was grimy to the point that the plates weren't readable pulled up at the diner in Watertown where Richie was waiting. The horn was honked twice and Richie got in. There was Jack behind the wheel. Richie asked, is this Tommy's car? Jack replied, it'll do. In the meantime, the U.S. attorney was in court trying to obtain a search warrant for Tommy's house. At 9.15 a.m., the postal agents observed Tommy's wife's vehicle returning home. They noticed that it looked like she had been driving through the mud, but it wasn't Tommy's wife. It was Jack and Richie. They swung around the back and entered through the garage door that was always left unlocked. They went up the stairs into the kitchen, then down into the basement. Jack instructed Richie to remove the wall panel neatly with a chisel. Richie told him, no problem, this thing is up with thumbtacks. They had the panel off and the eight postal bags removed and the panel back up by 9.23 a.m. Each carried two sacks and made two trips to the station wagon where the bags were covered by a blanket. They left the driveway by 9.30 a.m., the exact time the search warrant was issued for the house. Jack and Richie transported the money to a nursery in Dover, Mass. The money would be buried in a greenhouse under the potting soil that was stored there. Dad asked Jack if he told Tommy that he was moving the money. Jack responded, I don't fucking tell anybody anything. They dumped the Chevy in Dadham and went for a stroll while they waited for Pro to pick them up. Jack had decided to bring in Pro because besides his two arrests in 1961, he was an unknown entity and didn't have the heat on him that the others did. This would be their first mission together. The only thing on Jack's mind was how did the authorities stumble across Tommy? Was it Billy or someone else? Meanwhile, the agents arrived and knocked on the door out of formality, knowing full well that no one was home. They decided to wait for Tommy's wife's return and hope that she would confess where the money was hidden out of fear of them destroying her home. When she returned 15 minutes later, the agents noted that she must have washed the car since it was no longer spattered with mud. They never realized that there were two different cars. It took Jack and Richie 15 minutes to get the loot out of the house and another 20 minutes to bury it and pay the owner of the nursery $10,000 for his assistance. It took the postals and marshals 15 hours to destroy Tommy's house. They ripped open every wall and ceiling. They tore out the floorboards, broke out the patio, and welded open the water storage tank. They even broke open the cinder blocks that made up the foundation, working under floodlights well into the evening. What did they find? A 45 caliber pistol, a bulletproof vest, a shotgun, $330 in $10 bills, and two wide leather belts under a hat in Tommy's closet, and one empty 45 caliber clip and two empty footlockers, except that the footlockers were no longer empty. Tommy's wife had used them to store extra clothes, including seven pairs of shoes, five sets of pajamas, one leather harness, one snowsuit, three pairs of socks, four blankets. Quilted crib pads, three undershirts and training pants, eight pants, two terry cloth shirts, one white sweater, one rain hat, one sports shirt, and one vest. This is way worse than the warrant for Specky O'Keefe's baby chair. And they took all of it and didn't give any of it back. To make matters worse, the following day the FBI showed up and dug up the septic tank. 
According to Inspector Dune's statement released on October 23rd after they destroyed his home, Tommy supposedly told them that he might be willing to talk to return the money for the reward, but was afraid of being shot in the head. None of this seems plausible. Tommy supposedly met Dunn and Sims again on the 18th in a parking lot near his home. The agents claimed that Tommy asked if he had to pay taxes on the reward money. He wanted to know how much he would receive after the taxes were deducted from the $100,000 reward. They claim that the person who planned the robbery asked him to buy trunks to store the money in. The trunks were in his basement empty because the mastermind decided to store it in custom-made wooden crates instead. They asked Tommy what kind of car the mastermind drove, and he said it was a Chrysler Imperial. He claimed to meet him at his mother's house by accident. Every time he visited his mother, the third person magically showed up because he had a sixth sense. Tommy and the mastermind third person met on October 3rd at 521 Southern Artery in Quincy. Postal inspectors were watching them. Tommy claimed to have met the same person on October 7th at 40 Dexter Street in Watertown, which was where Tommy's mothers lived. On from October 2nd to October 22nd, the postals had Tommy's house under constant surveillance. It's as if they were trying to get Tommy killed, issuing insane statements in the newspaper. They also claim that Tommy told them that he was in possession of 65 to 75 percent of the loot and that the third person mastermind had the rest. He supposedly named him in front of the inspectors to his wife and blamed her for wanting to go on vacation to the Cape. Dunn stated that Tommy's wife said she wanted the thieves arrested immediately as she said they would come and kill them. Finally, Garrity, the same Garrity from the Brinks case, issued a statement. Garrity stated that considering what was found at Tommy's house, he would not be issuing an arrest warrant. Garrity's story matched the story I heard that Tommy refused to cooperate or talk about the case. Tommy threatened to sue. Garrity said he could, but he would fight him every step of the way. On November 2nd, Inspector Don and two other agents arrived at Jack's house. He had hoped to get a little extra help from the local police chief, asking him to arrest Jack on a phony charge and hold him while the postals tore Jack's home apart. The police chief refused. So Dunn had to resort to Plan B. He and another postal inspector, McNabb, waited until they were sure that Jack wasn't home. Since Jack was under constant surveillance, it wasn't that hard to make that determination. One group of postals followed Jack to Lawrence, 30 miles north of Watertown, where they reported to Dunn that the coast was clear since Jack was visiting Joe Tripoli. Dunn's plan was to get in, take anything that looked incriminating, and leave. Jack's wife, Elizabeth, opened the door to see Dunn and McNabb. Dunn announced, we have a warrant for the arrest of John J. Kelly for a bank robbery in Ohio. More horseshit since he claimed the warrant was from 1957, which was when Jack was in prison. Before Mrs. Kelly could demand to see the warrant, the men pushed past her and marched upstairs. They subsequently ripped apart the house looking for evidence. Unable to get into a locked closet, they forced the door open. Inside, they found two empty money bags from the First National Bank of Boston, a length of clothesline, $235 in cash, and some shotgun shells. At this point, Jack called home from Joe Tripoli's house. Maybe a neighbor called since... Since Dunn told Mrs. Kelly that she couldn't call out, not even to her pastor. On the phone and between sobs, Mrs. Kelly told Jack what was happening. Jack told her to put Dunn on the phone. Dunn offered to meet Jack at the postal annex in Boston to talk about the situation. Jack refused, saying, you wait right where you are. When Jack arrived home, he asked to see Dunn's warrant. Of course, there wasn't one, and Dunn had failed to get one in the time that he was in the apartment. But the icing on the cake was that all the items they'd taken from the closet had already been sent to a laboratory to be examined. Dunn said that he'd replaced the $235 with his own money and pointed to a side table where it was sitting. Up to this point, Jack had remained outwardly calm, but now he flashed back to Ed McNamara and Billy planting the $16 bills on him at Suffolk Downs. It was the final straw. He picked up the cash off the table and threw it in Dunn's face. Get out. Don't try to plant any money on me. The Postals didn't stop pressuring Billy. They showed him a wanted poster of Frank James Machine Gun Campbell and told him that Jack had hired Campbell to whack him. And Tripoli was continuing to be pressured to identify Tommy as one of the participants in the Essex Trust robbery from back in March. Finally, in December, the pressure got to Billy and he confessed to Jack what he had been doing. Jack, of course, already knew and had been one step ahead of him. Jack put the word out that he was looking for Billy by asking around for him in his usual places. 
He knew it would only be a matter of time before Billy would surface. Finally, he showed up at the diner. He looked like shit. The stress of his secret agent life had taken its toll on him. Before Billy could plop himself down in the booth, he blurted out, I swear I didn't tell them anything. Jack played the concerned father role and offered him money to get himself together. Billy told him that it was weak Rico who first pressured him, that the feds and the postals wanted Jack for the Plymouth job. By this time, Billy had latched onto Jack's hand. Jack brushed him off and said he had no clue what he was talking about. That was Jack's opportunity to suggest that they both needed a lawyer. He convinced Billy that the authorities were trying to frame them both. Jack offered to introduce him to his new attorney, F. Lee Bailey. Jack had been using John Fitzgerald as his attorney, but fired him after an unsavory incident at Fitzgerald's office. He arrived for their meeting about what legal action could be taken to get the postals off his back. But when Jack walked into the office, he saw Dorothy Barshard fleeing in some state of undress. Looking across the room, he saw Joe Barboza holding onto Fitzgerald's ankles as he held him out the window. To relieve the tension in the room, Jack made a joke and got Barboza to free Fitzgerald, but Jack was through. He wasn't going to get wrapped up with someone on Barboza's enemy list. Gangsters were bad news in Jack's book. Quote, the only place you find them is in prison or the cemetery, and I don't want to go with them. Barboza plopped Fitzgerald on the floor and asked if he had seen Dorothy. Jack proceeded to tell him that she ran down the hall. It would be a little over five years before Fitzgerald would lose his leg in a car bombing incident while driving Barboza's car. Fitzgerald's fling with Dorothy would last that long, and Fitzgerald wasn't Dorothy's only side piece. Our bonus episode on Dorothy will be coming out this Friday morning, December 31st. But now, Jack needed a new lawyer. On Monday, December 10th, 1962, the Boston Globe ran a front page article stating that federal investigators had told them that the Great Plymouth mail robbery had been solved. Sounds like the same claims they made with the Gardner heist 50 years later. The guilty parties were known and would be arrested in the next three weeks. A new federal grand jury was set to convene the following Monday, and the case would be presented to them. Contacted by the Globe, the assistant U.S. attorney stated, our main thrust has been toward total recovery of the money. Therefore, the alleged guilty parties were being allowed to roam at will in the hope that they might lead investigators to the money. The four men weren't named, but it was clear that the authorities had not changed their minds that Billy, Jack, Joe Tripoli, and Tommy were the thieves. Confidential memos had been issued to local law enforcement to keep the four suspects under constant surveillance. The memo also instructed local police not to arrest or stop the men, but to allow them to go about their business. We want proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We don't want to gamble with one and a half million dollar case, the AUSA said. Nobody wanted to see a repeat of the Brinks Circus. You'll recall from episode three that in November 1952, two months before the statute of limitations ran out, federal prosecutors threw together a case and presented it to the grand jury in hopes that someone would slip up and break the case for them. The drama played out for weeks with contempt charges against Wimpy Bennett and Specky O'Keefe's family, among others. The prosecutors ended up with egg on their face and not a single indictment, and the contempt charges were all dismissed on appeal. The next day, another article about Tommy and the raid on his house appeared on the Boston Globe's front page. That evening, Billy Norton, a Boston traveler reporter, contacted F. Lee Bailey and told him that Jack and the others wanted to take polygraphs in order to clear their names. Bailey agreed, and the following day, Jack and Joe Tripoli arrived at Bailey's office. According to Bailey, Tripp was about five feet six, stocky build with graying black hair, a widow's peak, and a friendly dark-eyed smile that was showing strain around the edges. Jack told Bailey that he wanted him to represent the two of them. Even though he had previously refused to take polygraphs administered by the feds, he was now willing to take it if it was impartially administered. On the 14th, they met again to administer the test. Tripp went first, but the place was so crowded with reporters wanting to catch the breaking story that they couldn't get an accurate read. Bailey declared the test, quote, inconclusive, unquote, and said that they would try again the following day. On the 15th, they met in a suite at the Parker House Hotel. As they were wiring Trip for the retest, Tommy walked in. He stated that he also wanted Bailey to be his lawyer. In the meantime, Billy had called Effley's office and been told where to find the others. He walked in just after Trip finished testing. Trip's test came back clean. He knew nothing. Then Bailey told the other three that they should wait to see if the postals would agree to the independent polygraph before they went through with it. 
but he did ask that they all take a mini test about any conflicts of interest between them since they all wanted him to represent them against the Postals. Of course, Red and Tommy beat the test. They had nothing against one another, but Billy flunked. Jack and the others went to Bailey's office nearly every day for the next two weeks. By the end of the month, Bailey said, says he approached Jack and asked him straight out, do you think Billy might be a spy for the Postals? Anything's possible, Jack replied, but it seems funny that they'd put him on the flyer if he wasn't a real suspect. That could be just a cover, Bailey said. Billy flunked the lie test cold. You didn't tell me that before, Jack said. You mean the bastard's against us? Could be, but if he is, we might be able to work to our advantage. Let me try something. Of course, Jack already knew all of this, but wasn't going to let Bailey know how and why or how long he had been plotting to turn the tables on Billy and the Postals. Bailey reassembled the full group. Gentlemen, he said, I want you to all of you to be extremely careful not to get so provoked at these post office clowns that you get into any physical fights with them. That would be very bad. They carry guns and you might get hurt. I am going to give each of you a cheap and very simple camera. Anytime you see a postal inspector near you, take his picture and keep snapping until he leaves. This may give you some peace and give us enough evidence to get an injunction against these sons of bitches. Just bring all the film to me. I repeat, don't get provoked into fights. Any of you could get shot at any time. He turned to Billy, especially you. What do you mean, Billy said? Why me? Bailey pulled out a copy of the poster that offered a $50,000 reward for the arrest and conviction of the robbers. Quote, there's a phrase in this reward offer that provides that any robber who is killed while resisting arrest will be deemed convicted for the purposes of the reward. In other words, the easiest way to get the money is to kill you. This cuts out waiting for the trial or risking the possibility of acquittal. You, Billy, are a especially likely target. You have a record for armed robbery and have carried a gun in the past. So whereas the others are not considered dangerous, you are. Anyone could gun you down and then claim that he thought you were about to shoot him, end quote. The next morning, Billy was waiting at the door when Bailey arrived at his office and confessed everything. I've got something to tell you, he told Bailey. I've been working with the postal people, steering them on Tommy and Kelly and Tripp and some other guys. They've been paying me every week, 75 bucks, and they said I'd get a big reward if anything broke. Billy unbuttoned his jacket, loosened his tie, and began. A few days after the robbery, he said, some postal inspectors came to me and said I could help them. They said I was a convicted bank robber and probably could give them some good leads on who might have done the Plymouth job. I told them I wasn't interested in being an informer, even if I knew something, which I didn't. Then they told me that they could get my parole, go to my parole board and get me violated so I would have to go back in the can. But if I cooperated, I could get some cash, maybe a whole lot of it. All I had to do was give them some names. I didn't want to go back to the can, so I agreed. I figured if I give them some bullshit, and when they didn't get nowhere, they leave me alone. They asked me to take a lie detector test so they'd know I wasn't involved myself. I took it, and they said I passed and gave me 50 bucks. Then they asked me if John Kelly might have been in on the job. I said, sure, he could have done it. He's smart enough. So they asked me if Kelly knew anybody who didn't have a record and could hold the money without being suspected. I had once met this guy, Richards, with Kelly, except that at the time, his name was Baghdadlian. He had a steady job, as far as I knew, and no record, so I gave them his name. I also mentioned Tripoli, who used to be in business with Kelly selling used cars. They put taps on all their phones. They would play the tapes for me to see if I could tell who was on the other end of the line. Anyway, on the same day they busted into Kelly's apartment, they talked to Richards in a post office in Fall River. He denied knowing anything, but they thought he acted suspicious. When they told me that I egged them on, I said he probably had the money buried somewhere near his house. The date that Billy gave conflicts with information in the newspaper articles, but it's not that important. Quote, then they found out that he put in a new cement patio right after the robbery. They were sure that was the spot. Dunn saw Richards the next day, but couldn't get anything out of him. They wanted me to help them break into the house some night when no one was home and make sure the money was around. And then they would get a warrant. They even gave me money to buy some rubber gloves so I wouldn't leave any fingerprints. But that never worked out because when Tom and his wife went out, they always left a babysitter. Finally, they said they were positive Tom was the right guy and they were going to get a warrant anyway. They said they could file a statement saying Tom admitted having the money and that would be enough. I said, how the hell could you do that if Tom said he didn't know anything about the money? 
They said it would be Tom's word against Dunn's, and any federal commissioner would take the word of an inspector against the word of a slob like Tom. So they got a warrant and ripped up the house, and they didn't find a goddamn thing, end quote. Bailey replied, well, if Kelly and Tripp and Tom were the guys who pulled off the robbery, they would also be the kind of guys who might get wise to you and buy you some cement shoes. Did you ever think of that? Of course, said Billy. I had some other names I could have given, but those names have guns. Kelly and the others are just clowns. I knew they wouldn't do anything. If you're not afraid of them, Bailey said, why did you decide to tell me all of this? It's the goddamn poster, Billy said. I could get shot in the face on account of that thing. The postals are so goddamn stupid. You have no idea how stupid they are. You know, one time they told me they didn't know nothing about robbery cases, and I was running the investigation because I was an expert. How do you like that? Me, the expert of an investigation. Billy said, Bailey said, you have done your friends a grave injustice. I think you should do all you can to repair the damage. Sure, said Billy. What do you want me to do? You have spied on us, and that was a grave transgression. I think the only fair way you can repair the damage you've done is to do a little counter-spying. You mean I should keep working for the Postals, but really be working for you, right? Billy said. Exactly, said Bailey. Billy agreed, saying the Postals would never catch on. They're too goddamn stupid. And he was right. Bailey hooked Billy up with a wire of his own and sent him to see Wheeler. Billy's mission this time was to get Wheeler to repeat the story about the $100,000 reward for Tommy's head and the other extrajudicial activities the Postals had been involved in over the course of their so-called investigation. Billy had the intel Bailey needed within five conversations. In addition, Bailey told Billy that he wanted the money Billy was getting every week from the Postals. I'll give you dollar for dollar, but I want what you get. Billy agreed, and they shook on it. On December 28th, Bailey, Jack, Tommy, and Tripoli went on the radio. And the following evening on TV, Bailey laid out the charges against the authorities, putting them on the defense. They each stated that the government had offered them $250,000 for identifying the holdup gang. Garrity denied this allegation, saying that the only offer on the table was one of up to 200000 and was open to anyone who supplied information. In the meantime, Bailey drafted a 16-page document outlining Billy's adventure with the postal authorities, including the yellow phone with the line that ran from the house next door to Billy's basement. Bailey alleged that the authorities were involved in bribery, payoffs, and threats in an effort to entrap Jack, Tommy, and Joe. Billy had to find a way to sneak into court to file an injunction along with Bailey. This injunction would prevent the authorities from contacting him and continuing to use him as an informant. Billy also claimed to have tapes of the authorities threatening him to entrap Jack. Bailey charged the inspectors with illegal wiretapping, intimidation, and attempted bribery. After he brought the claim to Senator Saltonstall and Kennedy, he then wired Washington, D.C., Both senators then sent a telegram to U.S. Chief Postal Inspector Henry B. Montague requesting a response to the accusations. Tommy didn't enjoy the thrill of the chase like his cohorts did. Sure, he was a bank robber, but he was also a family man. He wasn't as sharp and ruthless as the others. His paranoia from feeling he was being followed every minute of the day was taking its toll on him. The postal authorities would drag Skena and Barrett to his job weekly, asking, Are you sure this isn't one of the men who robbed you? His home life wasn't much better. He had to rebuild his house bit by bit, and his wife spent most of her time in tears. And Jack had to keep his distance. Tommy was alone. Jack wasn't worried, though. In his opinion, the law was six cupcakes short of a dozen. They were too busy blaming each other for one another's stupidity to actually do something. But what did worry Jack was what to do with the roughly $900,000 buried in the nursery. Until he came up with a new plan, the loot had to stay put. In mid-March 1963, Billy's wife won the grand prize at the New England Home Show. This, of course, merited a write-up in the Boston Globe by one of Bailey's favorite journalists, Bob Leary. The grand prize was, quote, a complete family room set with a refrigerator, a portable bar with stools, a TV, a sound system, lamps, a slide projector and screen, three pieces of Danish furniture, and other gifts. We're going to leave you there. As we mentioned before, on New Year's Eve, we'll be releasing a bonus episode about Dorothy Barchard. Dorothy was a very busy girl. Listen in to find out about her bows and occasional participation in a robbery here and there. Next week, we'll be discussing Pro Learner. There's much more to come about Jack and his crew and, of course, Billy. So subscribe to find out when those episodes launch. Please like, share, follow, and leave us a review. Bye. Bye.
Double Deal, true stories of criminals, crimes, and lies.